Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. I want to focus on that phrase, peace on earth. Everybody say that with me. Peace on earth. Let's pray today. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together. Lord, I just pray right now that by your spirit you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, our hearts are open to receive from you. I pray that any obstacle would be removed. We take authority in this room. Lord, if there's any hindrance, anything that's preventing us from receiving from you today, Father, we take authority over it and we break that, that stronghold, that obstacle in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I step back as you step forward, less of me and more of you. Your words and not mine. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody says, as you're seated, look at your neighbor one more time and say, you look good today. Come on, say that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. You know, we've been, we've been talking about peace. We've been talking about how one of, the, one of the aspects of the Christmas story, the biblical Christmas story, is, is when the angel shows up, and he shows up to the shepherds, and he says, glory to God in the highest. In other words, glory to God everywhere. Everywhere they're giving glory to God. Amen. And then he says this phrase, and he says, and peace on earth. And that word peace, it, it means so many things. It, it, to, to have peace means that you have you, so many things at your disposal, that God has, has given you peace and that you can apply it in so many different ways. And two weeks ago, we learned that we need peace from the battles of life. Amen? That, 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 that sometimes the battles that we face in our community, in our, in our homes, sometimes the battle that we face in between our ears, the battle in the mind, right, our thoughts. Uh, we're living in a world that's, that's filled with a lot of chaos and, and, and a lot of anxiety, and we need, we need peace. That, that word peace literally means to experience tranquility in the midst of war, in the midst of havoc and the rage of war. And so, so God gives us peace. But the second, second thing that we learned last week is that, is that when, it's, when God gives us peace, he's also giving us peace between two people. There's peace in relationships. And, and it seemed like last week that really hit home to a lot of people. That, that what many of us, we, we've held grudges. We've held unforgiveness towards somebody. We've been hurt. We've been betrayed. We've been let down. We've been disappointed. We've been abused. We've been neglected. We've, we've been hurt on a deep personal level. And, and what ends up happening is there's these walls that we build up. And, 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 and all of a sudden, we don't let anybody in. And, and we're very careful. We're very guarded. And, and what ends up happening is, is, that, is that we're not experiencing the peace of God. There's animosity. There's an unforgiveness there. And last week, we talked about how God heals that relationship, how God, more importantly, he heals you, how God can heal your heart, that, 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 that forgiveness is not for, for the other person necessarily, not just for the other person, but forgiveness is for you. Can I get an amen? amen. I, I remember the quote I said last week that forgiveness is setting the prisoner free only to, to discover that you're the prisoner. That, that what ends up happening is the offense is, holds you down. But today I want to talk to you about peace as it relates to in another aspect. And this is the definition that we're going to work with today. When, when God says that he gives us peace, he, he, he means this as well. It's a state of security, safety, and prosperity. It literally means that in your life there's nothing missing and nothing broken. Now think about that for just a moment. When we talk about the peace of God, when we talk about the peace of God, we're literally talking about how in your life there's a state of security, that you can be secure, that you can know that you're going to be okay, that you're going to be protected, that there's safety, amen? There's safety in your life. There's safety in your marriage. There's safety in your family. There's safety in your health, safety in your finances, safety in every aspect of your life. But it's security, safety, and prosperity. Everybody say prosperity. prosperity. See, a lot of times people in the, in the church world, in the community, and just in general, when we think of prosperity, we think of riches. How many of you know that riches has little to do with money and, and, and more to do with your, your relationships, your emotions? You can drive a nice car. You can have a, a brand new car. You can have the most expensive car. You can live in a great neighborhood and not have prosperity. You can have, you can have things and not have prosperity. Amen. This is why the Bible says that when God gives us wealth, he adds no sorrow to it. Amen. That you can have wealth in your life. That you can have wealth in your family. Wealth in your relationships. Wealth. Wealth is not just money. Wealth is, a guess, guess what, I can sleep at night. 
I can, I can be at rest at night. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to be worried. Amen. Wealth is that my, my relationships are good. My relationship with my children are good. Relationship with my spouse is good. Relationships at work is good. I'm at peace. Why? Because I'm walking in the prosperity of God. Somebody say amen. amen. God didn't call you to walk in poverty. God didn't call you to walk poor. Again, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about in your heart, in your emotions, in your thinking. Come on. In, in your lifestyle. Amen. In your influence, in your leadership, in your marriage. God call you to walk in prosperity. I prosper because of who I know. I prosper, prosper because of who is in me. I prosper in my thinking because he's renewed my mind. I prosper in my attitude because he's changed me from the inside out. I prosper. Amen. Come on, somebody give God praise that he gives us prosperity. But it doesn't only mean that I prosper. It means that in my life that there's nothing missing and nothing broken. There's nothing missing and nothing broken. I said that there's nothing missing and nothing broken. How many of you can remember a time where maybe uh, you worked on a, on a puzzle? Anybody ever worked on puzzles before? And you got a, a thousand piece puzzle, right? All right, let's lower it for some of you, all right? A hundred piece puzzle. Now, I'm not going to lower the bar. I'm going to raise it. A thousand piece puzzle, 10,000. You, you're working on the puzzle, and what ends up happening? You, you find a piece missing. And what happens? Oh, you like, you're so happy. You worked five hours on this thing, and you've lost a piece. It frustrates you, it aggravates you, it annoys you that you put all this work in, right? And, you're, and there's something missing. See, many of us, look at me, everyone. Many of us, you've worked hard to build your life. Many, you've tried so hard. You put in a lot of effort in your marriage, in your family, in your thought life. You put a lot of effort in your education. You put a lot of effort in all these different things in your life only to find out that there's something missing, that there's something broken. The Bible tells us in John 10, 10, it says, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus' purpose, he says, my purpose is to give them, give us, a rich and satisfying life. Another translation says an abundant life, a thriving life. I, wanna, I just want to focus on the first part for just a moment. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the enemy of your soul. He's talking about your, your adversary, the one who is against you, the one who lies to you, the one who deceives you, the one who discourages you, the one who wants to drain you of all hope, the one who's out to get you. In Spanish, we call him el cucuy. Come on, somebody, amen. I don't know if that's what we call him, but that's what I was, that was called when I was a kid, amen. El cucuy. Uh, some of you are looking at me, what's el cucuy? It sounds like an Indian food. It's not Indian food, all right? It's, it's the adversary. It's the devil. It says that his purpose is to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Now, that, that sounds a little bit redundant, doesn't it? It sounds a little bit like, like it's overstating it. But he says that he comes, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And as I looked at this verse, I learned that each of those, each of those things is targeting something different in your life. When the enemy comes to steal, that word steal means he comes to, stay, to, to steal by stealth, by stealth mode. In other words, you can't see him coming. You can't see, you know, what he's doing in the darkness. You can't see what he's doing behind the scenes. The Bible says that the enemy comes to steal. In other words, he, he, he comes like he did in, in, in the Garden of Eden in, in, in Genesis chapter 3. It says that the snake, is the, the, the slippery, right, the conniving, the deceiving snake, serpent, worked his way into the garden and in, into a, a conversation with, with Eve. And then the rest is history. If you know the scriptures, he deceived her, but it was by stealth mode. In other words, you can't see it coming sometimes. The, the thief never announces himself, does he? The thief never says, here I am at the door, for the most part. Now, I remember many years ago uh, when Rosie and I were, were living in Texas and I had just picked up picked up the most, most exciting, frustrating game I've ever played, golf. I like to call it the most, uh, I like to call it the, the, the most relaxing frustration that you'll ever feel. Because you get on and it's this little ball and you're hitting it with your clubs. And you should be able to master it, but the ball would never go where I wanted it to, amen. And so the ball always went where they didn't cut the grass, amen. 
And so, so I, I, I was into the game, and I bought some clubs. I really like these clubs. And one day when I woke up, I come to find out that someone had broken into my car, and someone had taken the clubs from, you know, from the hood, from, excuse me, from the, from the trunk, excuse me. And they, 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 took the, they took the clubs. And here's the thing what happened is, and if anyone has ever experienced someone breaking into your house or to your car, what ends up happening is you feel like a what? You feel like a victim. And all of a sudden, something, you feel violated. Like someone has, has gotten into my property, someone has gotten into my stuff and taken something that I worked for, that I paid for. So when the enemy, when the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, what ultimately, it's not just that he wants to take something from you. Everybody listen to me. It's that he wants you to live like a victim. Is he wants you to live like a victim. And how do victims live? They live in fear. Right? In our neighborhood, in our street, our street, in our, uh, we, we all, all the houses, they all put Christmas lights. They all put Christmas lights, except for one. They, he used to put up lights, but for the last several years, he hasn't put up lights. And the other day, one of our, our neighbors who lives at the end of the cul-de-sac was walking down, and Rosie and I got to talk to him, and he was just admiring all the lights in our street. And he was saying, man, isn't it cool how everyone puts up lights? I'm like, yeah, it's so nice. And, he, and then he goes, except for that one guy at the end of the street, the cul-de-sac, he doesn't put up lights. And I go, yeah. I go, I remember he used to decorate his house. He used to go all out. And, and I said, I wonder what happened. And he goes, he goes, well, I actually live right next to him. And he goes, we used to, we used to talk a lot. And I go, you did? And I said, do you know what happened? And he said this. He goes, yeah. He says, everything was good until COVID happened. And once COVID happened, he says he never comes out of his house. He doesn't talk to anybody. His wife doesn't talk to anybody. And he, and, and he makes his kids stay inside. Isn't it amazing what fear does? It causes you to retreat. Fear causes, because you want to know why? Because fear is contagious. But God didn't call us to live in fear, does he? And when the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, ultimately he wants you to feel like a victim. But he wants you to be afraid. Because if he can get you to be afraid... He'll paralyze you. He'll cause you to retreat into your bunker, into your cave. But the Bible says not only does he want to steal, but the Bible says that he wants to kill. Now that word kill literally means, and this shouldn't come as no surprise to anybody, but to end your life, physical death, to, to end you. Now why would God, why would the enemy, excuse me, why would the enemy Satan want to end our lives? Because he sees the, the potential that you have. He sees the purpose. He doesn't know the purpose, but he knows that God has put purpose on you. Amen? That God has a purpose for your life, that there's significance for your life. And if he can end your life, he can end the purpose of God. And that's one of the reasons why he wants to kill us. Because if he, he wants us, to, he wants us to, to, to quit. He wants us to he wants to stop the will of God and the purpose of God from being lived out in our lives. And I think about this. I think about all the young people. I think about all the young people who died prematurely. Shouldn't have died on the streets. They shouldn't have died in that drive-by sh shooting. They shouldn't have died at that party by somebody shooting them. They shouldn't. I think about the, the movie stars and the recording stars that died way too young. They, they, that, they're, that, that we will never see that potential realized or fulfilled. Why? Because the enemy came to kill. But the Bible says not only does he come to steal, kill, but he also comes to destroy. Now I'm thinking, my goodness, I mean, wouldn't kill be enough? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be enough for, for, for the scripture to say the thief comes to, to steal and kill? That, like, that would be it? But no, it says steal, kill, and what? Destroy. Now what does that mean? If you, if you look at the meaning of the word destroy, you'll discover that he's, not, he's talking about something even deeper. He wants to destroy us eternally. In other words, he wants you to experience not just physical death. Listen, he wants you to experience spiritual death. He wants to separate you from God's presence for an eternity. How many of you remember the story of Lazarus and the, and the rich man? Lazarus was a beggar outside the door of the rich man. The Bible says that he would beg the rich man for scraps. And one day he died and went to heaven. But the rich man also died that same night and went to a place of suffering. Now, please don't misunderstand. Your wealth doesn't determine where you go. Your poverty doesn't determine where you go. It's what you say to Jesus. Amen? It's how you respond to Jesus. The Bible says that, that the rich man in hell was in a place of suffering, in a place of torment. 
in a place and he looked up and he could see the heavens. He could see what was going on in heaven. And he saw Lazarus. And what did he say? He said, Lord, he said, please send Lazarus to, to dip, to, to just take a little bit of water and to touch my tongue, to end this suffering. You want to know what the suffering was? It wasn't the flames. It wasn't, it wasn't the thirst. It was that he was separated from God. That's, the, that's the, 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 the worst place you can be. It's separated from God, not just here on earth, but for an eternity. And this is what the enemy wants. He wants to destroy you spiritually. He doesn't care about your giftings. He doesn't care about your talent. He doesn't necessarily care about your purpose. He cares about your soul. He wants to destroy your spirit. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 the, the Apostle Peter says this, stay alert. Everybody say, stay alert. In other words, wake up. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. If they're nodding off a little bit, give them a shake. Come on. <laughs> give them a shake. Give them a stir. And if you have to, give them a Holy Ghost slap and say, wake up. Amen? <laughs> Some of you like got too excited with that right there. What that pastor said? I want to be obedient. <laughs> All right. Hand out a pledge card. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Watch this. It says, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Who's your enemy? It's not, your, it's not the preacher right now. It's not the church. It's not your coworker. It's not your HOA. It's not your neighbor. It's not your, your suegra, your suegro. Come on, somebody. It's not your in-laws. It's not, it's, not, no, it's not the person driving down the road. It's not the government. It's, that's not your neighbor. That, excuse me. That's not your enemy. You want to know who your enemy is? The great enemy is the devil. Satanás. Come on. El diablo. El cucuy. El chamuco. I don't know. Whatever you want to call him. The Bible says he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Listen to what it says in verse 9. It says stand firm. Everybody say stand firm. It says stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Here's the part I want to emphasize right here. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. You, you want to know why I put this verse in here? Because you got to know this, that the hardships, that the attacks, that the disappointments, that the betrayals, that the, 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 all the stuff, all the pain that people go through. Listen, you're not the only one. You're not the only one. The, the Apostle Peter, Peter says right here, he says, believers all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering. The same kind. There's nothing new under the sun. Since the birth of the church, Satan, our enemy, has always worked to silence the church. Guys, it's happening in Latin America. It's happening in communist countries. It's happening around the world and in Asia. It's happening in Muslim countries where, where the enemy is trying to silence the church. The enemy is trying to silence the church. And so the sufferings that you go through, the sufferings that you may be experiencing, there's nothing new. You are not alone. This is why the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, he says this, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. And it says again, stay alert. And be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So that means that we should be in prayer for everyone everywhere, all the believers, because all believers at some time or another, they're going to go through a crisis. They're going to go through a hardship. They're going to go through trials. There's going to be tribulations. There's going to be betrayals. There's going to be disappointments. So what must we be doing as believers? We should be praying and not complaining. But some of us, we've learned to become professional complainers, haven't we? Man, we're quick to complain. We're quick, we're quick to complain. We're quick to whine. We're quick to compare our lives to others. Well, how come they have that? And how come they, they never seem like they're going through problems? You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what they face. Just the way they don't know what you face. So quit complaining, quit crying, and start praying. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, share each other's burdens, and in this way obey the law of Christ. So in other words, when you're going through trials, when you're going through hardships, God never intended for you to go through it alone. He gave you family. Family. It says, share one another's burdens. 
You don't have to carry that alone. You have someone who's praying for you, and you have someone who wants to walk with you through it. All right, some of you, you don't want to be honest. You, you want to pretend like you, you want to pretend like everything's good, but God knows what you're carrying. Come on, we're all carrying something. And so God gives us these two verses so that we can know that someone's praying for us and someone's there to help us. And I'm thinking to myself, everybody, I think to myself, listen to this. Man, if only there was a place. If only there was a place where you could go to to be able to share your burdens with somebody. If only there was a place where you could go and there would be peers there to listen to what you're going through and to really care about you and to then say, can I pray with you? If only there was a place or a group of people that were available to you so that you wouldn't have to carry all this burden alone. If only there was a place you could visit on a weekly basis from Monday through Saturday. Huh, I wonder if Lifeway has anything available to the men and women of the church, to the brothers and sisters. Come on. Is there anything that we have that you could take advantage of? Hmm, I wonder. Thank you very much, Matthew. Life groups. They're like, no one understands me. No one gets me. No one's there for me. My question is, have you gone to a life group? Well, no. Well, then it's your fault. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Pastor, did you just call me a horse? Some of you have a long face. I'm joking. You're a handsome horse. There's no denying that things come up in life. <laughs> we experience hardship, disruptions, and attacks in life. But this is where, watch this, this is where God's peace shows up. That in the midst of the hardship, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the suffering, there's a peace that comes on you. Amen? It's, it's safety, security, prosperity. That on your life, that in your life, there is nothing missing and nothing broken. I think about the woman, uh, uh, the woman who had the issue of blood. We, we talked about her, you know, about several weeks ago. But a woman who was bleeding for over 10 years. She was in on her cycle for 10 years. I mean, think about that, ladies. Having an eternal cycle, I don't want to know. But you know. And here's the thing is, is that this woman was in dire need. She visited all the doctors that she could. She, the Bible says that she used all her wealth to see the best doctors, and no one had an answer. And so there she was, bleeding. Please understand this. This made her... This made her disconnected from her family because in those days when that was happening to a woman, she had to withdraw from her family. She was considered hygienically unclean. She was con considered religiously unclean. So she had to withdraw. So guess what? That means that for 10 years she couldn't be with her family. For 10 years she had no interaction. For 10 years she was alone. For 10 years she's untouchable. For 10 years no one could talk to her. For 10 years. She wastes and she spends all her money trying to get better. But this woman hears about a man named Jesus. And she hears that he's a healer. Are you with me today? She hears, oh, this man has the power to heal. This woman had never met Jesus. This woman had never interacted with Jesus. But she says, I know that there's a healer. I know that there's someone who can make a difference. And so what does she do? She takes an extraordinary step of faith. And she says, I'm going to break the rules. I know that I'm not supposed to go into the community. I know that I'm not supposed to go into the village. I know that I'm not supposed to be close to people. But I have to touch this man. I have to touch. If I could just touch his garment, if I could just touch his robe, he goes, then I could get healed. If I could just touch him, he doesn't have to pray over me. He doesn't have to acknowledge me. I just got to touch. I don't even have to touch his flesh. I don't have to touch his hand or his hair, just the garment. And so she breaks the rules and she presses in. She presses in. And do you know that she was putting her life on the line? Because if she's discovered, they had every right to take her out of the community outside the township and stone her to death for breaking those rules. She presses in and she presses through the crowd. And Jesus is walking by. Now follow me here. The Bible says that she presses in and she leans in. And what happens? She touches the garment of Jesus. Now I want you to remember this about Jesus. Jesus was actually on the other way, on the way to another miracle. 
Someone had come to him and said, oh, my daughter is dying. Can you please come and pray? So he says, let's go. So as he was focused on another, another issue, he was focused on another need. But when this woman touched him, he stopped. Isn't that amazing? He stopped. God, God may be focusing on someone, but your faith can cause him to stop. Come on. He stopped, and the Bible says that when she touched him, it says that she was healed, and he stopped, and he said, who touched me? Who touched me with their faith? I want you to hear what he says at the end in Mark chapter 5, verse 34. It's, it says this. It says here in the scripture, it says, and he said to her, daughter, he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. In other words, it's your faith that healed you. It's your faith that released healing on your body. The bleeding has stopped. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Physically, you're fine. But he didn't just say, you're healed, did he? What did he say? Go in what? He said, go in. He said, go in. So watch this. What was he saying? He's saying, your faith healed your body. But now I'm declaring peace over you. Because over your life, there's nothing missing and nothing broken. You're walking out of here not just healed, but you're walking whole. You're not just healed in your body. But now I'm restoring your relationships. I'm restoring your family. I'm restoring your community. I'm restoring your life. You don't have to walk around with a shame of sickness. Come on. You don't have to walk around. Why? Because I'm declaring peace over you. Nothing missing and nothing broken. My friend, when you come to Jesus Christ, when you go to Jesus Christ, he doesn't just heal you. He doesn't just save you. He doesn't just restore you. But he declares peace over you and he says, in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your finances, in your thinking, there's nothing missing and nothing broken. I walk in the peace and the prosperity of God. Come on, somebody praise him like you have peace. Somebody pay, praise him like you are prosperous, amen? I walk, I walk with confidence knowing, knowing that I've got the peace and prosperity of God in my life. That there's nothing missing and nothing broken. Amen? The Bible says that he releases peace. Everybody say peace. peace. Yes, peace. Some of you, you've been going through it this year. Some of you, you've had a hard fall. Some of you, in other words, a hard October, a hard November and December. Some of you have been struggling in your relationships. You've, you've, had, you've had some things come up with your children and your health. And you say, man, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm just going through the fire right now. I want you to know something that God declares peace over you. He says that there's nothing, nothing missing and nothing broken. Amen. Listen to, listen to what the Bible says about the peace of God. The Bible says this. It says that it guards our hearts. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. Listen. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. It's not on the screen right here. But what does the peace of God do? It says, it says this. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. Your emotions and your thoughts. How many of you know that those two are connected? That how you feel, listen, will always affect how you think. And how you think will always affect how you feel. You see a situation, something comes up in your life, and what happens? All of a sudden, your feelings and your thoughts are distorted. And now, worst case scenario, now the world is ending. Now, everything is about to fall apart. Now, I'm alone. Now, I've been abandoned. Now, no one loves me. Now, but what does God say? It says, listen, my peace will guard your heart. And your mind. It also says that the peace of God doesn't make sense. It says it surpasses all understanding. I, some of us, we, we should be curved up in a ball in our bedroom somewhere. Crying out. In fear and anxiety. But you want to know why we're not? Because God's peace that surpasses all understanding guards our hearts and our minds. If not for the peace of God. Amen. It doesn't make sense. How does it work? I don't know. When does it activate? I don't know. All I know is it does. And the Bible says that this peace, not only does it guard our hearts and our minds, not only does it not make sense, but where do we get this peace from? The peace comes directly from Christ himself. Listen to what it says in John 14, 27. It's not on the screen, but li listen to what it says. It says, I am leaving you with a gift Peace of mind and heart. There it is. Jesus says, again, peace of mind and heart. Some of you, you're looking at me, and you so desperately want peace of heart and mind. Your mind has been going, going, 
and going. You've been thinking about the problem. You've been thinking about the betrayal. You've been thinking about the issue. You, and, and, and have you ever noticed that in, in your life, when you start thinking about it, it never gets better? That your thoughts never take you to a better place. They always take you to a worse place. Right? My marriage is not going to get better. My life's not going to get better. The money situation is not going to get better. But this, be, this, this peace that we talk about comes directly from God, from God through Christ. It says, I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. Listen to what it says. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Listen, listen. Don't be troubled or afraid. The, the world can't give you that peace. And if the world can't give it to you, listen, then they can't take it from you either. See? In this woman that, that I mentioned earlier, what he was saying to this woman is your, your suffering is over. Your emotional suffering is over. Your relational suffering is over. Your mental suffering is over. Your suffering period is over. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. So the question is this. Is it, well, Pastor, how do I experience this peace that you're talking about? Well, let me give you three things to think about this morning real quick. Number one, how do you experience this peace? Number one, remember who you can go to. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Let us come boldly to our gracious God. Remember who you can go to. Let us come boldly to the throne room of our gracious God. And there we will receive mercy and find the grace to help us when we need it most. So, so we have to remember who we can go to. See, think, think about this. Who you turn to in crisis says a lot about where you really put your faith. See? See, there, there's nothing wrong, listen, there's nothing wrong with going to a caring family and trusted friends, right? But how many of you sometimes go to the wrong people when you're in crisis or when there's a problem? Sometimes, sometimes we, we always go back, sometimes we look for people to validate our pain, our suffering, you know? Like we go to, to, the, to the aunt, we go to the uncle, we go to the best friend, Right? And they necessarily aren't speaking with wisdom. And you go to them, you're saying, well, you know what? I, I just, I'm having a problem with my spouse. And there's some issues. And instead of building you up, what do they do? They bring you down. I told you he wasn't for you. I knew it. I knew it. If you would have asked me before, I would have told you he was wrong for you. But now you got to suffer. That. Come on, what kind of friend is that? Right? You start a business, and all of a sudden your business is struggling, and then your friend said, I knew that was a bad idea. I wish you would have told me. I would have told you not to do it. Come on, what kind of friend is that? But how many of you know that when we're going through crisis, we have to know who we can go to? It, it, eternal and internal peace can only come from God because he is the true source of peace. Listen, let me visit this, this woman again with the issue of blood. I said it a, a while ago. Did she know Jesus? No. Has she ever talked to Jesus? No. Has she had any contact with him? No. Now watch this. But yet she approached him in faith, and yet because of her faith, Jesus healed her. The power of God came out of his body and into her body, healed her. Now watch this. If he was willing to do that for a stranger... When I approach Jesus, I don't approach Jesus as a stranger... I approach him as a son, and I go, Daddy, Abba, come on. I say, Lord, God, here I am. And when I approach him as a son, guess what? I'm approaching him as in relationship. There's a relationship there. And then he says, Son, what do you need? Son, what's going on? Son, here I am for you. Son, you need peace. Here it is. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Why? Because I'm a son. I know who to go to in my crisis. Here's number two is I have to remember who's with you. You have to remember who's with you. Matthew 28, 20. Jesus says this at the end of the verse. He says this. And be sure of this. I am with you. I am with you. Wait. Who's with us? God is. When? Always. So what a powerful promise that there's never a moment that God is not with you. 
There's never a second, there's, that, that there's never a moment for those of us who've accepted Christ, for those of us who said yes to Jesus, for those of us who've embraced a relationship with God, that there's never a moment that God forsakes us. There's never a moment that God abandons us, that God forgets about us. Isn't that amazing? That means, listen, if God is always with us, that means that everything that we face, listen, and in every moment, right, and, and, and through every situation, that means that we never face it alone. Isn't that powerful? You know that thing that, that blindsided you? You know that problem that came on you that you didn't see coming? You know that issue that between, you know, in your family, in your marriage? You know that money issue? You know that, that those thoughts, those, those things at your job? You know all that stuff that, that you face, that hardship, the pain? You know what? That moment that stuff hit you, God was with you. That means that you don't have to, you don't have to carry it alone. You don't have to face it alone. Amen? Listen to this. Don't get so overwhelmed that you forget where you can go to. Amen? And don't get so overwhelmed that you forget who you can go to. See, what a powerful promise that you never have to face anything alone. Knowing that God is with you brings a peace to our lives. It settles you. It sustains you. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm with you always in adversity, in conflict, in crisis, in hardship, in despair, in attack, in disappointment, in discouragement. I'm with you. In sickness, I'm with you. In every season of life, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Don't forget who's with you. Don't tell me who's, don't tell me who's against you. Tell me who's with you. Don't tell me who's not for you. Tell me who's with you. And here's my final point is remember what God has spoken. Matthew 24, verse 35 says this, Heaven and earth shall perish, but my words will abide. Another translation says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain. How many of you know that earthly things fade? Did you know that? Earthly things fade. Your looks fade. Your hair fades. Come on, somebody. Your car fades, your house fades. Things fade away. Things are not getting, they're not, they're not advancing, they're slowly deteriorating. Why? Because that's the nature of life. We are fading away. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that heaven and earth will fade away, will perish, but my words, his words will remain. So watch this. The enemy, I'm almost done here, the enemy will always release words over your life to destroy you. You're a failure. You've messed up. You've made too many mistakes. You've hurt people. You're no good. He, all those words come at you. Watch. The words that you embrace will determine the quality of life that you live. So you have to be careful whose words you're listening to. That's why we got to listen to the right words. Now listen. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then he said, let there be light, and there was light. In other words, how did he create all of creation? Everything that we see, the Grand Canyon, the majestic mountains, the oceans, the sky, the stars in the night sky. How did he create that? He created.